Welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Tim Horniak. I'm the author of Loving the Machine, The Art and Science of Japanese Robots, and I'll be your host for today's show. Robotopia Rising is part of the Kennedy Center's Festival of Japan, Culture plus Hyperculture. Joining me in the studio is Matt Alt. He's the author of Super Number One Robot, Japanese Robot Toys, and Battlefield High School's robotics team, the RoboCats. Before we go on, I want to remind you that this program is interactive. You can send us your questions uh, through the phone number that's going to appear on your screen or by email. Uh, we look forward to hearing your questions later on in the show, so send them in. Uh, during the show, we're going to take you on a historical journey that uh, chronicles the rise of robots in Japan. We're also going to profile some of the country's most amazing robots, the Honda Asimo and the Toyota Partner Robot. They're incredible machines. Later on in the program, we will sit down with two of the industry's leading lights, Dr. Hiroshi Ishiguro and Tomotaka Takahashi. And we will also talk with some young scientists who are building robots on their own as we explore Robotopia Rising. Welcome back to Robotopia Rising. Joining me in the studio is Matt Alt, author of Super Number One Robot. Matt, thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here. It's great to have you here. Uh, Matt, now you are a native of uh, Washington and uh, uh, you have been a fan of robots for a long time, haven't That's you? That's absolutely right. Some would say even a little obsessed. How did you get into robots in the first uh, place? Well, it's interesting. When I was a child, there were a lot of Japanese animation shows on TV, which are called anime, and they sold products of some of these. And actually, one of them that I got as a Christmas present when I was a young kid just really sparked this deep interest in learning more about the robots and the characters themselves. Okay. Uh, what did you do from there? Did you uh, become inspired to follow your dream with that's, robots? Yes. That's, so you could, you could actually say that robots changed my life. I actually live in Tokyo now, okay. and I run it with my wife. I run a small translation company that specializes in Japanese entertainment products, video games, anime, comic books, and that sort of thing. Okay. Are robots still part of your everyday life in Japan? <laughs> I suppose you could say that. There are robots all around the office, and many of the products we translate deal with robotic themes. Uh -huh. So video games and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of cool video games featuring robots in Japan. That's but true. I know that you also have a special collection of uh, robot toys. You want to tell me about that? Uh, that's true. I do have a collection of robot toys, and I loaned them to the Kennedy Center, about 30 of them. Okay. And they're on display at the they Kennedy Center? They are on display at the Kennedy Center. And actually, I brought one to the studio. We should take a look at it. Okay. Um, let's uh, look at it in a sec. We're going to look at some uh, images of uh, robots and uh, jumbo machinders is what they're called. That's right. This one here. Now, this toy is two feet tall. It's made of polyethylene plastic. And in Japan, it's called a jumbo machinder. Okay. And as you can see, they have Japanese written on their chest. And that is what really fascinated me as a kid, because I couldn't figure out what was this strange writing. I asked everybody around me. It turned out they were from Japan. OK, cool. What is this robot's name? The robot that we're looking at right now on the on stage here is called Grendizer. It's from a 1976 animated series of the okay. same name. I think I remember that uh, being broadcast in Canada, my uh, native country, as Goldorak. Yes, it was, it was, it was broadcast in a variety of names. So um, he has a whole bunch of interesting weapons and stuff here. Uh, what are some of the cool missiles that he's got? Oh, he, yeah, he sure does. As you can see on his shoulders and legs here, they have the missiles all over them, and they actually he's got these giant uh, sword-like things in his chest. He's just kind of a giant robot. He's just bristling with weapons. He amazing. sure is. Uh, but most Japanese uh, robots are a bit cuter than our friend uh, Grendizer here. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was doing the research for my book, uh, Loving the Machine, which is over there behind Grendizer, um, I found that the history of robots goes back uh, quite a long way, uh, in fact, centuries. And I had to, the chance to explore some of this tradition. Um, I visited the Nagoya area, and I uh, got into what's called karakuri dolls over there. Karakuri dolls are amazing 
clockwork dolls. Have That's you ever right. seen some of these Karakuri dolls? I have. Dolls? I've seen them in museums. They're really amazing. They are incredible. They operate uh, using clockwork uh, technology, springs and coils and uh, gears and that kind of thing. And uh, in the Nagoya area, uh, as I said, so, some of them are performers on these large floats during the religious festivals that they parade around through the, sea, the streets of the city there. Uh, you can see them performing acrobatics on stage, changing their costumes in the blink of an eye. Uh, there are amazing magicians, entertainers, and actors all rolled into one of these Karakuri dolls. We're going to show you some, uh, some video here of uh, these clockwork dolls coming to life. Check it out. It's really amazing. Robots have been around in Japan for a long time. Centuries ago, master craftsmen in Japan created astounding dolls that delighted the people. These dolls were known as Karakuri Ningyo. Not only were Karakuri rich in craftsmanship and beauty, they could move in surprisingly lifelike ways. These ingeniously wrought dolls are the ancestors of modern Japanese robots. Karakuri were powered by wind-up mechanisms like spring coils. They could serve tea and shoot arrows from a bow. Karakuri enchanted everyone, from young children to samurai lords. They are still a big hit. Well, Matt, what did you think of that amazing uh, Archer doll? Pretty cool stuff. It's beautiful. They're kind of like the ancestors of modern Japanese toys. They are. I love the way that little doll could take an arrow out of the quiver and put it in a bow and fire it like that. Yeah, not Just bad like, for 18th century technology. Amazing stuff. Well, speaking of that technology, we have some of it right here on the table. Uh, this is Karakuri technology in action. Uh, this is called a Shinansha in Japanese, which means a South pointing chariot. Uh, as you can see, it has two wheels here, a uh, base and a, a geared mechanism here in the middle. And this um, is a pretty technical, uh, elaborate uh, setup here, but all it does is no matter which way you turn this little chariot, it always points in the same direction, the figure on top of it. This south pointing chariot goes back um, quite a long way apparently all the way back to the ancient Chinese emperors. Did you know that? No, I did not. What did they use it for? Well, they used to uh, cross the Gobi Desert in China, and uh, of course that's a big wasteland, it's easy to get lost there. They used these uh, south-pointing chariots on their own chariots so they could always know which way south was, so hmm. they could get across the desert um, safely. Uh, I love these little things, they're really cool toys, and um, there's no compasses or magnets or anything like that. Uh, and so this is, you know, the heart of the modern robots in Japan comes from this kind of uh, clockwork technology. Well, you know what? What is another big influence on uh, the rise of modern robots in that Japan? That would be anime and manga. Anime and manga, yes indeed. Anime being Japanese animation, manga being Japanese comics. I want to introduce you to uh, one of my favorite uh, icons of Japanese animation and comic books. And his name is Astro Boy. Astro Boy um, was created by a comic genius, as he's known in Japan, called Tezuka Osamu. Osamu Tezuka in English. Uh, we, the names are backward in Japanese, uh, different order anyway. But uh, Astro Boy, as you can see, is a really cute little uh, robot hero from the pages of uh, Japanese manga. He had seven special powers, didn't he? He did indeed. I, I'm not exactly, I don't remember exactly what they were, but he was a little powerhouse. I think one of them was Searchlight Eyes, and uh, he also had an atomic uh, engine. He was created at a time just after World War II in Japan when the country was devastated from the war. Uh, the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, uh, of course, devastated and laid waste by the atomic bombings of those cities. But he had his own little atomic engine, and Tezuka wanted to show that this technology could be used for peaceful purposes. Uh, and you could see that uh, in the pages of this um, manga, it says Tetsuon Atomu, which means literally iron armed atom. Isn't that right? Strength. It's all about how strong it's he is. It's all about how strong he was. Yeah, he was kind of like Mickey Mouse and Superman rolled into one cute little package. You can see the very, uh, you know, detailed drawings that uh, Tezuka did uh, chronicling the adventures of Astro Boy. He kind of acted as a bridge between humans and uh, robots in these amazing science fiction stories of the future. Uh, were you a fan of Astro Boy when you were growing yeah, up? Yeah, absolutely, much? absolutely. <coughs> Astro Boy was, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, an inescapable presence in Japan, and mm -hmm. even in America to a certain extent, since it was broadcast here in the 1960s. Do you think he even influenced the uh, culture of those jumbo machined or Oh, certainly, because, you know, the, it's the changing tastes of kids. Back in the 50s and 60s, it was all about robot little boys and heroes and things like that. By yeah. the 
70s, the little boys wanted to drive their own giant robots, and that's exactly what my robot toys are all about. Yeah, well, not only that, Astro Boy was responsible for inspiring generations of Japanese who grew up and wanted to become roboticists of their own, like the characters in the, in the manga books, and create their own Astro Boy, basically. You go to Japan uh, today and you talk to any roboticist there, and chances are they're going to tell you that my inspiration was Astro Boy, especially the older generation roboticists over there. Well, uh, speaking of roboticists, um, how did Japanese go from anime and manga to building real robots? They were inspired, like I just said. Uh, they started building these, their mach these machines like that to be you know, humanoid in form, like Astro Boy. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Professor Ichiro Kato. I have not. Tell me about at it. At Waseda University. He was a roboticist there in the early 1970s. He started by making prosthetic hands, prosthetic arms, and then eventually a full-scale uh, prosthetic, well, an artificial human in a sense. He made the world's first full-scale anthropomorphic machine, so a human-like machine. It had a head, two arms, legs, and apparently it had the intelligence of a one-and-a-half-year-old. That's what Which is pretty amazing for 70s technology. It is right. It was like 1972 when, uh, when I came into the world, so they were all building robots before me. I was born in the year of the first video game. It was called Pong, I believe. Oh, yeah. great. Anyway, uh, technology is uh, the timeline of our lives. We're going to take a look at some footage here uh, of some of these early mechanical walking men that uh, Professor Kato and others developed. Let's check it out. In the 1970s, scientists at Waseda University in Tokyo created Wabot, the world's first full-scale humanoid. Machines that looked like human beings were taking their first steps. In 1986, Honda Motor began a secret project to make a two-legged robot that could move like a human being. Inspired by both Astro Boy and Wabot, Honda engineers began with a simple pair of mechanical legs. The machine was clumsy and slow, but it gradually evolved. After much experimentation, the legs started walking naturally. The engineers at Honda overcame the challenge of mastering human locomotion in robot form. Wow, wasn't it cool to see that amazing, hulking, prototype ro wo robot walking like that? I, I never get tired of watching that footage. Never. It's you, just great. Why? He's just like one of your jumbo machineers coming to life and walking. Yes, it's a, like but that. it's the culmination of decades of Japanese uh, trial and error and technology. That's right. You know, the researchers that worked on those machines went on to evolve them into what's called uh, ASIMO, the Advanced Step in Innovative Mobility from Honda. Of course, they started out by looking at all kinds of uh, uh, animal gates, the way animals move around, ostriches and whatnot. They went on to look at humans, the way they walk around, sumo wrestlers and geishas, and they concluded, concluded that humans are the most efficient walkers. So uh, when they uh, unveiled ASIMO to the public in Japan, it caused a sensation. Uh, they've continued to improve and upgrade ASIMO. I don't know if you've ever been to a press conference announcing a recent ASIMO. I you actually, one of those he's, he is a superstar in Japan. He's a superstar in Japan. Uh, he gets as many reporters as Tom Cruise when Tom Cruise comes to Japan to unveil one of his um, uh, movies. Uh, so ASIMO, uh, I'm a big fan. I think we have some more footage of ASIMO here, possibly. Um, ASIMO is, is an amazing uh, machine that can walk around just like a human being, walk up and down stairs uh, just like you or I and do even more advanced things that require some artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence is a real challenge in robotics these days because it's easy to make the, a mechanical machine but much harder to make it smart. Uh, we can see Asimo moving around an office setting, recharging himself automatically. And uh, not too long ago I went to the um, Honda Motor uh, headquarters in Tokyo and I got a chance to order drinks from Asimo and he came and served it to me uh, on the table without spilling the drink and then he bowed to me and uh, I, I didn't know what to to really say to Asimo in return for his you know serving me the drink and bowing I just said domo arigato he's and also quite a dancer I he's see. quite a dancer look, look at him jogging around like that um, he's amazing just like uh, Michael Jackson or Barishnikov. Uh, they define uh, dancing uh, as uh, well the ability to dance just like a human being but running is the ability to have two legs off of the ground two feet off of the ground at the same time that's what's called uh, robot running so when Asimo was unveiled, I think the last one, uh, we saw him running around on stage at the press conference and he was really moving quickly. 
And I actually felt a little bit of a shiver of, uh, well, you know, this is really neat to see this, this thing moving around so fast, but what if it sort of turned to, to me and, right. and ran at me? But uh, no, Asimo is a friendly little robot. Well, the amazing thing that. is how he improves each and every time he comes out. Unlike humans, this robot gets better, faster, and stronger every time you see him. Just like the $6 million man. Just right? like the $6 million <laughs> man. all that science fiction uh, coming to life. Um, you know, well, uh, up until now, um, Asimo has been a kind of uh, experimental robot. I recently had a chance to uh, chat with his main inventor, who told me that uh, even though Asimo has not been uh, commercialized yet, uh, they plan to commercialize it and put it on the market, perhaps in the next 10 years. Um, but I don't know if you've seen another robot that has been commercialized in Japan. Its name is uh, Wakamaru. He's this yellow household communication robot. Have you checked him out? That's an interesting name. What's, what's Wakamaru all about? Well, <laughs> Wakamaru actually is... Um, is we're going to move over to the demo table here. Wakamaru is a, is a really neat um, household communication robot that was named after a samurai. Uh, and now, uh, this samurai lived about a thousand years ago. And um, even though uh, Wakamaru was marketed, he has a pretty hefty price tag, uh, something uh, over $10,000, wow. I believe. So. Uh, maybe as expensive as one of your jumbo machine doors. He doesn't exactly look like a samurai. Look at those doe-like eyes and exactly. the, the expression on his face. Very exactly. Cute. Well, you know, um, I love Wakamoto so much, and uh, he even kind of um, inspired me, uh, you can say, to um, get into robotics a little bit. Um, next, we're going to show you a, a little kit robot. Uh, this guy is called Manoy. Um, Manoy comes from a company called Kyosho. And uh, you see that he has uh, kind of black and white parts. All the black parts here are servo motors. He's got 17 in total. And uh, all these cables go into his central computer where you can store uh, motions that you download from the internet. Let's turn him on and see if he wakes up for us. You never know with robots. Whoa. Oh. Coming to life pretty quickly. Doing and this little... is his opening routine? This is his opening routine. He bows because he's a polite Japanese robot. Of course. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, we, he's remote controlled. And uh, we have the controller right here which uh, Matt is operating. Uh, why don't you try another motion pressing that, that button oh, okay. right there. Let me try and that. see what he does. Well, I feel kind of like an anime character myself. <laughs> you look like an anime character <laughs> yourself sometimes. Um, well, I think uh, Manoy is, is real cute because uh, he's kind of a, a robot that you can hack around with. As you can see, he's got a bit of duct tape on his hand. Uh, he has been through quite a lot. Um, they told me it would only take me about six hours to put him together, but it took me more like uh, 30. Let's try another motion <laughs> okay, here. Which one Let's do you try want? that button there. Okay, I don't want this to self-destruct or anything. I think we're okay. He's doing a little Saturday Night Fever um, going action here with a kind of John Travolta style. I think style. he's a better dancer than you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. He's amazing. Yeah, he's like pumping iron, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah, look right at in that. the gym. You can hear him sort of clattering about. Um, he's kind of like the Tin Man of the Wizard of Oz. Uh, I have a great affection for him. Uh, and uh, these uh, servo motors are pretty dependable, uh, but sometimes they do burn out. I've had a uh, time when I had to replace uh, leg servo motors, and that was, uh, that was pretty dicey. But um, anyway, uh, one more um, uh, bunch of robots that uh, I want to show you that are kind of like this one, they're remote-controlled robots, uh, are from an amazing um, robot uh, professional, uh, a professional robot creator, rather. They're not amateur things like this. These are amazing creations from a fellow called Tomotaka Takahashi. He's from Robo Garage, which is down in Kyoto. One of your favorite cities in Wonderful Japan. place. Yeah, wonderful place. Lots of temples down there. Full of robots. He's going to tell us about some of his amazing robot creations. Let's listen to Tomotaka Takahashi. Well, how do you make a robot like this? What is the process? Uh... Well, process is kind of, it's, it's actually, first of all, it's a, my personal project. And I uh, started uh, in the beginning, I find some kind of theme about robot. Inspiration like, from someone. Yes, like for example, for Kuraino, I want something look like a uh, manga character, okay. but actually, which, you know, actually exists. And also I want him to walk more naturally, and I create some, uh, develop some uh, technology. A new technology. Uh, yes, okay. and then I started uh, designing inside and outside in the same time, and then I I wrote a lot of I draw a lot of sketches, 
and then I cut you know, materials, plastic and carbon fiber and put everything together. What know. tools do you use? To well, it's a mostly like hand tools, like uh, knives. Mm, like files, you know. Files, and yeah. knives, very yeah. ordinary tools. Yeah, ordinary, to yeah, you know, okay, ancient that's, tools. That's amazing. Okay, well, could you please now mm. uh, introduce uh, mm -hmm. each of your robots and okay. give us a brief demonstration? Okay. Uh, this robot is named Kuroino. And uh, Kuroino means uh, black one in Japanese. So he can stand up on his own and now does it on his hands. So that technology is uh, the knee is stretching uh, during the walk. And bowing. And he's also good at keeping balance. like this. Well, this is uh, another one. This is a uh, uh, FT. FT is a uh, first uh, female type bipedal robot. I got advice from professional fashion model to uh, program faster model walking. making pose and add another one. And turn it around. Okay, weren't those uh, little robots that Takahashi-san makes? Aren't they cool? They are cool, but not as cool as this. Not as cool as this. Let's take a look at some other commercially available robots that you can get in Japan. Here's one making a lot of noise right down on the table. This is Paro. Uh, Paro is a robot harp seal. He's a harp seal pup. Uh, real cute. Uh, has this soft fur. Under the fur, uh, full of sensors, touch sensors, that can uh, respond to your, your touch. Um, he's got these cute, uh, you know, blinking eyes. That there are cameras in there. He's got uh, voice recognition. He responds to his name, Paro, and you can give him another name and he'll eventually respond to that name, too. But uh, the best thing about Paro, of course, is his cuteness. Why don't you pick him up, Matt, and see oh, how man. that feels? Well, I've been waiting for this. Oh, yeah. Isn't he great? Paro Look is used oh. for uh, robot therapy in Japan. Um, don't get too close to Paro. Come on, you're, gonna get, you're not going to want to leave him. I can't put him down. I can't put him down. He's used for robot therapy in Japan in uh, old folks' homes, nursing homes, and uh, hospitals for sick children. And it's been scientifically proven that when you interact, give me the Paro. <laughs> when you interact with Paro, he uh, reduces your stress levels. Even though he may scream a little bit, uh, they can measure stress in hormone levels. And um, patients who interact with him, like I said, Feel more, feel more chilled out, and their caregivers also are more relaxed. In fact, he received the Guinness Book of World Records certificate for the world's most therapeutic robot, Paro. I He's feel more relaxed already. So do I. I feel totally chilled out and loose, and uh, thank you, Paro. You're amazing. I think the next robot that we're going to show you is another um, animal robot, and um, here he comes. His name is um, Ibo, and Ibo is awesome. from Sony. Okay, don't run away with that no, one. No, I won't. I'll try. <laughs> Ibo is from Sony. Ibo is a robot dog. Uh, listen to him panting like that, just like a real robot dog. A real ro dog, I should say. Um, he is so cute. He's got sensors all over his body. Um, he's got two microphones, one in each ear. Oh, and there he's going to get up for us. You woke him up. Woke him up, he's ready for action. You can pet him on his head there, he's got a touch sensor there. Oh, he likes that, look he at that. He likes that, oh yeah, he's real ginky, chipper uh, this morning. Uh, right on his back too is another sensor. 
Not quite as furry as Paro, not, but... Not quite uh, as furry as Paro. But equally satisfying. Yeah, he's also got a camera in his nose and a, a distance and uh, obstacle sensor there and one in his chest and a little speaker in his chest too. So he's kind of walking around. It's, it's fun to see him walk around your home. When he's running low on juice, he recharges himself uh, in his battery station. Uh, he just squats down there and, and gets all powered up for the next uh, uh, adventure that he has in your home. You can use these little flashcards with commands on them and you put them in front of his camera. And um, now he's gonna do a little dance for us, an Ibo dance. Check him out. <laughs> Complete with musical accompaniment. Exactly. Which is something most dogs can't pull off. No, something that most dogs well. can't pull off. I mean, people say their own dog is warm and cuddly and everything, but uh, you know, this guy has his own soundtrack. He does. It's amazing. And uh, he won't tear up your furniture. Or make messes on the rug. Or make messes on the rug, and you won't have to take him out for a walk either. It's like, I just love Ibo. Can't get enough of him. Oh, um, good dog. He was such a hit when he was launched um, in Japan. Um, he sold out in about 20 minutes. They continue to um, evolve each generation of uh, Ibo, uh, and their personality also, its personality grows and changes the more you interact with Ibo. Um, he's such a, a cute little dog. I wish I uh, had about 20 of them, but. Um, one is just enough for the time being. So next robot we were gonna to wanna to show you is a different style of robot. It's a humanoid. Here. I'm gonna get it from the table here. There you go. And this one is called Isobot. Now Isobot, as I said, is a humanoid. It's uh, human shaped. I'm gonna turn on the remote control and turn him on. Oh, do I get to control him again You this get time? to control him again this time. This is a big privilege. It is indeed. Here we go. Isobot has come to life. A little bow. Yeah. Very polite. They're all polite, aren't they? They are. He's more polite than you. No. Um, <laughs> he's ready for your command, he says. Okay. What's um, my command? What's, let's give it a shot. So, why don't we uh, point it at Isobot and see what he can do? Okay. If we push one and then P. Okay. And then go. Go. With a big X. Oh, he just did a neat chopping movement. Let's try one and K and see what that one does. One and K. Go. Robots don't always respond when they're supposed to, of course, and uh, it's fun to uh, wait for them to respond. Check out that amazing kick, that was pretty cool. Uh, another thing you can do is if you put them into another mode called special action mode, you go, I want special action mode. Next one. Okay, let's try B and go, see what he does. Gonna get down on the floor. What's this? And do some uh, floor routine here for us. He's rotating his arms. Check it out. Wait, he's break dancing. Break dancing. Actually, maybe it's more like calisthenics. <laughs> Check it out. Well, he's better at this than most humans are too. I, I, I can certainly not do that. <laughs> Another routine that uh, I want to show you, also in special action mode. He can also do uh, entertainment routines. I'm gonna do A, B, A, B, go. Oh. He does a western routine. Is this the Wild West on the tabletop? That's right. Make my day. Dirty Harry. Having a shootout with another robot, maybe? I, I think he's having a Matrix-like <laughs> moment here. Oh, check it out, he got hit. You got me. Backing up. What's gonna happen? Nice shot, Pilgrim. John Wayne. He's, he's full of great moves. And the Sergio Leone soundtrack. The Sergio Leone soundtrack, you gotta love that. Um, he's also uh, playing dead right there, but now he's gonna get up for us and go back into his ready position, ready for his next, uh, his next move. I love Isobot. Uh, he's from Tomy and um, comes with a remote control right out of the box and he's ready to go. Well. You know, if you thought that um, Ibo, our dog robot, was, uh, was cool with his dancing, wait until you see this next robot it has a real gift for music. It's called the Toyota Partner Robot. Hmm. Have you ever seen the Toyota Partner I Robot? I have had the privilege. It's an amazing, amazing humanoid machine. It plays the trumpet uh, just like Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, we have some footage of it here. Check it out.
Pretty neat stuff. Uh, what did you think of that tum trumpet playing? Oh, I, was, yeah, I loved how he's kind of grooving back and forth. Yeah, as he's kind of moving his hips and getting into she. it, you know. He could be a she. Uh, we, want, we don't want to call them he. You could call them she if you like. I tend to call them he just because I'm a he, but uh, if you're a she, call them she. Whatever floats your boat. Whatever, yeah, sure. Um, you know, one of the most amazing fields in robots today in Japan is the cutting edge. Um, uh, you know, uh, these robots not only look like they're doing something uh, that we humans do, like play the trumpet, but uh, they have real technology like that uh, Toyota Partner robot. It's got artificial lips and lungs, and it can, it's not just pre-record music, wow. in other words. It's actually making the so sound. It's actually playing the trumpet. It's actually playing the, the, the trumpet. And, um, you know, when the latest Toyota Partner robot was unveiled, I don't know if you saw it, uh, it can play the violin. Did you see that one? Is a robot orchestra far behind? A robot orchestra is not far behind. In fact, some of these uh, Toyota robots uh, were in a marching band together. One of them went solo. He did a solo career move, and now he's a receptionist <laughs> robot. His name is Robina. Uh, anyway, he, he's amazing. He's down in Toyota City at the showroom of Toyota down there. The next thing we want to uh, look at is androids. Are you into androids? Into androids. Well, I know about androids. <laughs> you know about You're talking androids? about robots that look just like human beings, right? That's right. Robots that look just like you and me. They've got artificial hair, uh, artificial skin, uh, and they're like the film uh, Blade Runner. You know the I science see. fiction film Blade yes. Runner, that classic that's full of uh, androids? Where robots are masquerading as That's right. They're called replicants. Society. Well, they're kind of coming to life now I in see. Japan. Uh, recently, I had the chance to sit down with uh, the android wizard himself, Dr. Hiroshi Ishiguro from Osaka University, and he told me uh, about his research into androids. Now, I know you're interested in something called android science. Could you explain what is android science? We take an approach from uh, brain science and cognitive science and psychology, but, uh, you know, the brain science and psychology is uh, well, focusing on the uh, particular functions in the brain. And the, we need a more systematic approach. That systematic means uh, you know, how the, you know, uh, the functions, they collaborate each other and how the, we can well, they generate the human-like movement and the human likeness. And the, by building Android, the, I believe uh, you know, we, we can get some new knowledge the how we can integrate the uh, many pieces, um, how we can integrate the uh, brain functions in our brains, and, and the how we can generate the more human-like movement, and, and so um, I think uh, the an building Android is another approach to understand what is humans. That is the Android science. Interesting. So we can learn more about humans by building robots and androids. Right. Okay. Uh, what about uh, an android you made called uh, Replie? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about Replie? So Replie is the, uh, my second android. I decided to make an uh, you know, adult android. And, uh, and the, the Replie is the, uh, well, the copy of uh, existing uh, uh, newscasters. And the robot has uh, more than 40 actuators, and the robot has many sensors. And the, in the World Expo, we have displayed the robot, uh, the Android, and, uh, and the robot could have uh, some uh, simple the communication with visitors. Did you make any other uh, Androids based on real people? Yeah, actually, I'm the, uh, I made the, my copy. A copy of yourself right. in Android form. Mm -hmm. So my idea was to install the uh, teleoperation functions for the Android. If I make my copy, right, the, I can teleoperate the robot, and I don't need to go the anywhere, well, because uh, you know I can send my copy and I can access through the internet. Stay in one place and remote control a copy of yourself. Right, exactly. That's amazing, just like science fiction. Do you think um, androids will one day be so lifelike, so much like a human being, that we cannot tell the difference? Yes, that, that kind of thing happens already and for the Ripley and the Gemini, but uh, you know, just for the particular situation and the particular purpose. Right? And so the, that is a very important point. You know, well, if we have a just a short the conversations, you know, usually well, it's quite difficult well, to distinguish which is which, right? But uh, if we spend uh, uh, one hour and one day and one year together, you know, it's easy to find what is that. So it's easier to find the, uh, 
the flaws or the, um, the errors or the uh, differences between the android and the human being if we talk longer with it. Okay, interesting. And what about apart from scientific research, uh, what uh, jobs or roles do you think androids can have in society? Yeah, basically, you know, the, my interest is to understand what is humans by building Android. But, uh, you know, my collaborators, I'm working with the companies and they are very serious uh, to develop a commercial version of the Android. And I, I guess, you know, the, they want to develop uh, the Androids for the simple communication tasks like uh, receptionist or some uh, tour guide or something like that. Speaking of receptionist uh, androids, we have one here at the Kennedy Center for the Japan Culture Hyperculture Festival, um, Actroid, uh, from a group that you work with, uh, Kokoro. Um, this is uh, wearing a kimono and uh, greeting visitors. Well, Dr. Ishiguro, thank you very much for being on the show. Welcome. Amazing stuff from Dr. Hiroshi Ishiguro. Well, Japan is a robot powerhouse, but countries like the United States are making great strides to compete in this growing industry of robots. Uh, with a focus on science and technology, uh, robotics programs in this country are starting to take off in high schools and colleges nationwide. Joining me now is robotics coach and teacher Gail Drake to talk about this phenomenon. Gail, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, now, please tell me about the robotics program that you're uh, participating in. Battlefield High School is a technology high school. We specialize in multiple technologies and specifically information technology. Our students, our faculty, and our administration have embraced robotics. Okay. Absolutely love it. We are a four-year-old school with our third year into robotics. At this point in time, we already have five different robotics teams, one that competes in the first robotic challenge and four that compete in the first technology challenge. Okay. Uh, first year into first robotics challenge, we were the world champions. Wow, congratulations. And for our, thank you, it was an exciting year. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about the goal of the program? The ultimate goal is to expose students to different areas of technology and particularly into those technologies that we feel are going to be leaders in the world. Robotics being one of those technologies and engineering being another. And in the program, we focus on how do you use your different areas in the um, education to be successful. A lot of geometry, trigonometry, and calculus to do your design work. Uh, when you're actually building them, it's almost like a physics playground. Okay. In addition to that, they learn how to do technical writing to write some engineering notebooks and to do their design specs. And then they need to do advertising so that corporations will sponsor them because it is all self-funded. Really? So they learn to write to companies. Okay. They learn to create websites. They learn to create multimedia presentations. Last year, the team took first place in website design. Amazing. Congratulations. So looking for another win there this year. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it's really neat to hear that uh, writing and advertising and marketing is also part of this program because in the future, when they become, if they become engineers, of course, that self-advertising is so important. Uh, so uh, that's really neat the way they're combining engineering skills and real-world communication skills. And project management skills. And project so they're putting skills. the pieces together all the way through the that's aspects. That's really neat. Well, you know, we followed uh, Team 194 from Battlefield High School as they prepared for the Virginia State competition, the first tech challenge. Let's take a look at their story. Robots are a part of our everyday lives. They're in hospitals perfecting surgical procedures. And they're in factories producing cars and other cool stuff. Robots are taking over. No, I'm not talking about world domination. What I mean is the field of robotics is growing, and that means we are going to need scientists and engineers to compete in this growing industry. That's why some of us are jumping on board and building our own robots. Hi, I'm Bobby. Hi, I'm Andrew. Hi, my name is Alex. Hi, I'm Roya. Hi, I'm NG. Hi, my name is Alex. Hi, my name is Thomas. We're students at Battlefield High School in Prince William County, Virginia, and we're competing in a statewide robotics tournament called Quad Quandry for the First Tech Challenge. Quad Quandry is a game of strategy. Teams have two minutes to score by placing three-inch PVC rings on goals of different lengths. Sounds easy, right? Wrong. Getting behind the controller and driving these robots is no easy task, and scoring is even more difficult. 
Teams can also score by moving the goals, so a good defense is just as important as a good offense. The upcoming tournament is the culmination of weeks of designing, building, and testing our robot. We based our design on human movements. <laughs> when I heard about grabbing rings, the first thing that came to mind yeah, was Yeah, it was a claw. That's all we could think of. Because how else do you pick up a ring and put it on a post other than a claw? That's when we came up with the claw. It's on a tower that goes up and down like this, and then it has an actual wrist that the claw moves up and down on, and then it has two kind of pincer kind of things that go like this to close in on the uh, little ring. With design in mind and scoring the ultimate goal, we built our robot with a competitive edge. We designed ours so we could score in the 24 inch post. That gets us five points. The most points you can score is a ring. Our strategy is to score, score, score. Our original design didn't quite factor in one thing, the opponent. During our scrimmage, we went up against a lot of defensive robots. These robots were built with plows and claws that kept teams like us from scoring. To battle against the defensive robots, we decided to go back to the drawing board. One robot had a device that that grabbed on to the scoring post while it was scoring and while it was dragging it around so other teams couldn't interfere with their scoring process. We decided to build another arm that would allow our robot to grab onto the goals. Today is our last day to work on the robot and with the design of the new arm still to complete, we're starting to feel the pressure. Definitely nervous because we got a lot of work to do tonight. We need to finish building the arm and start testing practice driving, build spare parts, tweak the programming, write journal entries, print pictures, write the essay, and practice interviewing. Whew! With our to-do list almost finished and the clock ticking, we decided to get some practice under our belt. Oh no! Suddenly, our motors burned out. The day is finally here. Today, we traveled to the University of Virginia to check in and have our robot inspected before the tournament starts tomorrow. Last night was a long night. We were there until 10 o'clock. We replaced the motor last night, the motor that wasn't broken. So we did that last night and now that works. And we changed the programming. So the wrist works a lot better than it did before. With our robot up and running, we were feeling confident that it would pass the inspection with flying colors. Right now, we're doing some final touches. We're adding our team tags onto the robot, they have to be mounted on the side. And then we're probably gonna take the robot up to the autonomous mode inspection table where they check our autonomous mode and make sure it's legal for the game. We passed, now it's back to work. Last night's setback cost us some valuable time. All of a sudden, something went wrong. While we were tweaking the programming to try and speed up the claw, it started crashing. It's causing the arm to shake whenever you tell it to move somewhere. So if we hold the ring and it's shaking, then the ring will fall out, so it's useless. Once again, we're up against the clock. After programming and reprogramming and testing and more testing, the claw stops shaking in the nick of time. With seconds to spare, we rush onto the field with our robot for a quick test drive. Well, I'm not sure how we're gonna do. We only got like 20 seconds to test the robot and it did okay, but we, we did overcome some of our major, major issues with the claw and the servos on the claw. And I'm glad we got those uh, through because we had some programming problems and we did, we fixed those and I think they'll be good for tomorrow. Our programming proved successful, but will it be good enough when we take the field tomorrow? 
With a championship title on the line, only time will tell. Okay, an amazing story there about uh, robotics competitions. Before we reveal the results of the first uh, ch tech challenge, I would like to invite the viewing audience, you out there, to send us your questions or the number on your screen or via email. We want to hear from you. Well, I'd like to introduce uh, members of Team 194. They're here with us today. Uh, guys, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, I want to ask you also, how did you guys do in the first tech challenge? Um, what was the result? Did you guys win any awards? Well, at the end of the competition, we took third place for the actual, the scoring, the winning, the actual matches. And we came away with the motivation award, which is pretty much the team with the most spirit, the most heart for robotics that uh, showed the most enthusiasm during the during the competition. The most enthusiasm, the motivation award. Well, congratulations, that's great. What kind of obstacles did you guys face that made it uh, quite difficult to uh, get to get this award? Well, at first, for our robot, we had difficulties with the arm and with the teams not working together as well as we liked them to. And um, we were had some hard times. But then uh, we started organizing ourselves and assigning people to do different groups. And we worked together a lot better. And by the end, we were working together as a team. We were all very supportive of each other. Okay, interesting. I think you have a couple of your robots here. Can you tell me a bit about one of them? Uh, is this from a kit, or how does it work? You built this from scratch? Well, the parts all come in a kit, but we cut them and, and, and fit them to our own specifications. Okay. Uh, I see it's got wheels. It's got a big arm. Um, what are some of the components we have in there? Is there a battery in there, too? Well, yeah, there's the batteries right there on the side that powers the whole robot. And the arm just goes up and down and flips, and the wrist opens and closes, and picks up the, the rings and puts it on the posts. Okay, so you can buy these things from a kit and mm -hmm. do whatever you like with them, whatever yeah. designs. How long does it last uh, per battery charge? Roughly. Uh, depends on how much you're driving it, but okay. probably about yeah. full charge, you know, it'll last about 15, 20 minutes. Oh, wow, so it's a, it takes quite a lot of power to move that thing, doesn't yeah, it? it? I does. guess it's, it's pretty big. Pretty heavy. I'd like to ask, what did you guys learn from this competition? Well, we we definitely learned how to work together as a team because we started out we were not working together as a team and by the end we we learned how to to you know get things done as a group instead of fighting over stuff <laughs> instead of fighting over <laughs> stuff let the robots do the fighting right that's right yeah anything you guys are going to do differently next year well next year the sophomores will be juniors and will be eligible to be on the FRC team which will take our experience from this and we'll we'll add it on to the bigger robots We'll also participate in the FTC team, help the new members come in, and teach them what, everything we've learned this year. That's great. So you're passing on the skills that you've learned to the next generation to keep it going. Uh, are you guys going to uh, tell them any secret uh, techniques that you learned along the way, secret tips? Well, I wish someone had told us some secret <laughs> techniques. Well, I guess you guys were, were pioneers in a way. Uh, that's really interesting to hear about your story. And uh, the robot looks really cool. Did you guys name that robot anything? Does he have a name like Manoy or Asimo? Or? Just 194. Just 194, <laughs> the fighting 194 a right here. A fitting name for a robot, actually. Exactly, very fitting. Okay, well, we're going to take some questions um, from uh, people out there via email and, uh, and calls. And I think we have an email question here. Um, it says, what do you think is the main reason for the development of robots in Japan? That's a good question. Matt, what do you think is the main reason for it? Well, you know, the Japanese population is aging very rapidly right now, and there's a really high demand for, for help. And one of the ways that, there, that Japanese society is hoping to help elderly people is by using robots. Not only robots, physical uh, humanoid robots, but also robotic suits that you can wear to help lift people out of bed and such. That's right. I heard they made a robotic suit like that recently that can help farmers uh, double their strength. Uh, Absolutely. These old folks who are working in the field, uh, you know, they can get like uh, twice as strong by strapping on one of these suits and then lifting re huge heavy bags of rice. Once again, it's like something out of anime. It's like something out of anime, but it, they're real robots that are coming to life and helping people in their everyday lives. Yeah. Let's see if we can take another question, maybe. Uh, we may have another email coming up. Um, let's see what the question is about robots in Japan or here in the States or, or anything in general. Um, I uh, love to hear people's questions about robots because um, they ask all kinds of things from 
How did you name that guy? To how right. much is the, what's the battery? Well, everybody's power on that got guy? their own different way of looking at robots, and so that's one of the great way. It's one of the great things about going out to the audience and asking them what, how they feel about it. I know people have been asking me all kinds of things about Ibo, uh, especially they love Ibo. They um, really want to play with Ibo, you know, when when it's uh, right there in front of them, and they really want to take him or home. Or Pyro, look Pyro how cuddly too. he I mean, is. I couldn't put him down. Pyro is is such a hit. Uh, you know, the old folks in Japan when they interact with Pyro in these nursing homes and whatnot, right. uh, they end up smuggling Pyro into bed with them at I night. I can see that. And so um, Pyro is such a hit. Maybe we're going to take a, a question from the audience uh, here in in the studio. Any guys? Any of you guys have a question for us? Yes, please. Um, we had the opportunity to visit the Kennedy Center uh, yesterday and see the exhibit uh, where we got to see the Toyota Partner robot. Okay. And I was just sort of wondering, uh, what's the purpose of the lights on its chest and head? That's a good question. What is the purpose of the lights on the chest, uh, on the chest of the Toyota Partner robot? I think part of that is just for looking cool. Um, and, uh, you know, to see this kind of, you know, horizontal light going up and down like that on his chest, it looks pretty neat. It looks like something from Tron. Remember that old gym? I do, yeah. absolutely. Um, I think part of it may also be to show the way that that part, uh, partner robot is breathing because he's using his artificial lungs. Uh, so certainly uh, functional and aesthetic. Uh, and the blue light's very soothing as well, I It think. is very soothing, a lot like Pyro, maybe. Uh, we're going to see if we have any other questions here. Oh. Uh, I think we have an email question coming up here. And it says, um, how long have you been collecting robots and how many do you have? I think that's oh, this directed is, toward you, This Matt. is a question near and dear to my heart, let me tell you. How long I, have you been collecting robots? I've been collecting robots basically ever since I was born, it feels like. One of my first robot toy actually was I got when I was about five. And it's, I've just been going strong ever since. And actually, now that I've moved to Japan, it's been a great boon for picking up more robots for my collection. Yeah, you were telling us before that uh, Shogun Warriors, I believe, was uh, one of the early brands of robots that you got hooked on. That's as, absolutely as right, and that was that came to America in the 1970s. It was made of a collection of a bunch of different Japanese robot shows, and it was one of the first times Japanese animation and science fiction came to American shores. Okay. And it had a big influence on me and a lot of other people Well, my I know uh, you showed off some of your robots at the Kennedy Center. That's right. And a lot of them were are really impressive uh, to, for all the kids to see, these uh, giant jumbo Machinders That's right. like that. They were really uh, interesting to look at. So colorful. We've yep. got a photo of one of them over behind your shoulder. That's true. I think that's it's, that's uh, Mazinger Z. Mazinger one of the, Z. That is actually the very himself. first, the very first jumbo machinder robot ever sold. Wow, he must be worth uh, quite a lot of money now if you can get your hands on one. If you can get your hands on one, that's right. Let's see if we can take another question from the audience. Any of you guys have any more questions for us? Yes, please. Uh, for Osimo and for the Toyota Partner robot, what type of uh, time and money and like manpower does it take to? create one of these. Well, wow. 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 <laughs> More than the six million dollar man uh, took, <laughs> maybe. Um, I think Honda officially says that uh, it will not reveal how much uh, time and money it has spent on creating uh, ASIMO. I think untold man hours, person hours of labor, uh, decades of research, and uh, probably untold millions of dollars on R&D that went into ASIMO. I think it will pay off in the future when robots uh, become really popular. They say, um, some people in Japan say that robots are going to become the car industry I of this century. I think we have another email question here. Let's see what it says. How do you see robots being used in Japan in the future? Matt, what do you think? Giant robots that we ride in and drive and fight together. No, I'm just kidding. I thought you'd say that. I think, you know, just like we were talking about before, I think there's going to be a, a big market for elder care robots, which okay. might not sound really that cool, but it's a, it's a critical segment of the healthcare industry. As you said, the population is starting to shrink in Japan, and uh, elder care is certainly a, really a critical uh, industry. We already have Paro. Yes. Uh, we have these strap-on exosuits that we That's right. boost your power that we mentioned before. So the elderly is kind of they're kind of like guinea pigs, right? For these these robots. <laughs> I guess you should look at it that way. Yeah. We're gonna take another question from the audience. Uh, yes, please. How does technology and education differ from J uh, Japan to the U.S.? Matt, what do you think about that one? Well, this is a in really interesting question because I think in America much of our technology comes out of the military. And so you've got robots like the Predator or all sorts of kind of scary sounding Terminator like robots. Yeah, the Predator robots. aerial drone. Absolutely. Uh, and there's also the Crusher, which yeah, the is an crusher. autonomous vehicle. Predator Crusher. There's also one called the Reaper, I believe. Right, the Reaper. And whereas in Japan, uh, much of this comes from anime and science fiction. And, and people are trying to create robots that help society. And so you'll have robots like Pyro, the, uh, the robot uh, seal which obviously is not much of a predator, no matter how much you look <laughs> at it. Paro can never be scary. Yeah. I think, uh, speaking of Paro, we've got another email question. Uh, it says, uh, how long does it take to make a robot like Paro? 
That's a really good question. Pyro looks really simple, right? Just a seal with some fur, deceptively simple. But it took uh, years of research uh, to make Paro. Uh, I know that Dr. Shibata, Takanori Shibata in Japan, who made him, put like uh, more than uh, five years or ten years of research into I that uh, uh, cuddly guy. Uh, he also made a cuddly cat robot called Nekoro, which was marketed in Japan. Um, so it takes a long time to get the look of the robot correct. The actuator movements uh, have to be uh, correct, and uh, of course, it has to be safe. Safety in robot in robots is key, Absolutely. especially in Japan now, as more of these uh, advanced robots are coming onto the stage. Uh, they're helping people in their everyday lives, and um, you know we don't want to get people injured by robots because uh, I don't know if you know, but the first uh, person ever to be killed by an industrial robot was a Japanese fellow. I see, was that a factory accident? As a factory accident, yeah, in Kawasaki uh, uh, Corporation, they had a, a factory robot, and uh, this poor fellow uh, went in to do some maintenance on the robot, and um, he forgot to turn off the switch. I see. And unfortunately, he met an untimely end. Uh, let's see if we have another question from the audience, please. Um, yes. Well, a couple de decades ago, they were having trouble making a robot simply walk upright on two legs. But now with these more humanoid robots, what do you think the next big advancement will be? That's a very good question. Um, Matt, what do you think about that? Well, now that they've kind of, I think, figured out, so to speak, the, how to make a humanoid robot, it's, it's going to take a big leap in artificial intelligence to really bring these robots into our daily lives. And I think, actually, that is where the next phase of development is going to be. I agree. Artificial intelligence is the way to go. We've run out of time. I'd like to thank our guests, Matt Alt and Gail Drake, for participating in today's program, as well as the Battlefield RoboCats. I'd also like to thank the viewing audience across the country for emailing their questions and sending their questions into the program. Thanks for being with us. Meet the artists after the show. You and your students can ask questions of the artists after each broadcast by emailing us at kcperfarts at aol.com. Don't forget to visit us online. There you'll find dozens of archived programs from previous seasons that feature artists such as members of the National Symphony Orchestra, Ballet Hispanico, the Billy Taylor Trio, lyricist Stephen Schwartz, cast members from Maine, and many more. Prepare for each program by downloading the study guide. Each guide includes background information about the artists, instructional activities, and additional resources to use in the classroom. The Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series, bringing the arts to your classroom.